Welcome to the May 9th Beehive production user call. We have Philip, Andrew, Chris, John, and myself, Michael. This was scheduled to be a hackathon, and we may get to that later in it, but we uh, start off with a bunch of topics, and so let's address those. Chris, you've been apparently very, very busy, and that's impressive. So in audio video news, I have been encoding this week's meetings with a new, new to me uh, M1 Mac Mini, and it reduces about an hour of screen time from 40 minutes of encoding to like under 10 minutes. You are welcome to hit the tip jar if you want to help me pay for that, but that definitely helps for weeks when I don't get around to preparing those meetings until the next week and then I serialize them and it takes like three hours instead of like 30 minutes. So yay, that's impressive. Uh, BSD can is rapidly approaching. Looking at the list, John, I don't know if you'll make it up there. Uh, I know some of you will not be going. Dan, Dan, you might be going. Welcome, Dan. Dan's just rolled in. Add list here. Dan L. No, we don't need to identify which Dan. And let's see. Also, the open ZFS call yesterday was quite fun, and we brainstormed the Open ZFS User Summit. It now has a name, and that will take place before the Open ZFS Developer Summit in October, last weekend, I believe, in Portland, Oregon. So I hope to have the wiki updated with a formal announcement today. So we discussed ideas for that event, such as hands-on, this, that, and that, configuration testing, you name it. So just before the call, Philip and I were talking about his desire to virtualize Windows 10 with uh, GPU pass-through and to use some additional devices such as the Sager J-Link. And I'll do a very quick brain dump here. I've been talking to Corvin and I almost got it working. I gesture, finger gesture, this close. Uh, first off, uh, you pretty much want to stick to slightly older machines. He's on like a 9500E Intel machine. Um, I've got some T hardware, so in theory that will work. And uh, there are tricks like needing a specific boot ROM. Because he is providing a complete Windows user experience, he is passing through the USB device, which may answer your question on getting the Sager J-Link to work, which is a, a embedded IoT system programming device, if I got that right. Philip, I'll yep. allow you to jump in. Oh, yeah. That uh, yeah, basically the two things that I'm working on, I'm working on more small devices. And uh, part of that is using CAD CAM applications that are uh, only on Windows. Uh, some of them are on Mac, but they're proprietary software that are required to work with the teams I'm working with. Okay. Um, and so the GPU pass-through would be needed to make them you know, reasonably functional uh, because they use lots of drawing, uh, lots of GPU sure. use Absolutely. on some of them. Uh, and then the USB paths through is separate. So if I'm doing uh, the firmware programming, uh, it'll use, you know, it doesn't really matter what you use for doing the firmware programming. You could use, you know, any uh, software compiler, but you compile it to basically hex code that you just dump onto the device. And the Sager J-Link is one of those things that can dump it onto the device uh, as firmware. And uh, that has drivers for Windows and Linux and Mac. Uh, and the notes that I've seen on the FreeBSD boards from years ago is that uh, it has not worked on FreeBSD. So I haven't really taken the time to test it. Uh, and so the workaround on both of these is basically have, you know, a, a Windows machine uh, and a Linux machine uh, that I just dual boot into sure. uh, for workstation because it's the, uh, the least effort to you know, be functional. It'd be nice if I could have it all under FreeBSD and have them as Beehive and just, you know, fire them up when needed. Uh, but it hasn't really been a big priority because I have an easy workaround with more machines. Yeah, sure. But uh, that should be a pretty <laughs> humble USB pass-through. And my point with the with Corvin's Linux, uh, Windows desktop is that he does the USB pass-through for a better user experience with keyboard and mouse. So, Oh, uh, that, yeah, this that is should work. totally worth exploring, and I might, might, might bring that hardware to Ottawa. Will you be in Ottawa? Phil? Yes, I oh, will yes, be in will. Ottawa. Perfect. Oh, well, then, yeah, let's have that conversation. They have hey. LLDB support. I'm pleasantly surprised to see that. Thank you yeah. very much. The complicating factor is my current notebook computer is 
not compatible with FreeBSD. It works with Linux, uh, but it, uh, it had a BIOS uh, issue when trying to boot up to FreeBSD. Really? Uh, so right now, yeah, mm. yeah, I, I was hoping it would be happier, but I, it's just one of those things that it might have BIOS that's just not happy and it is going to take more effort. It's a Lenovo P15V, I think is the exact model. What generation? Is it like the absolutely it, Gen 3 latest ones? Yeah, it's, an, it's a recent AMD and uh, it has a GPU on it. Okay. So I mean, yeah. all of those things that I didn't realize when buying it, when upgrading from my previous uh, T460 uh, that I didn't look carefully enough to see, you know, I mean, I was happy that it had two NVMe drives. Yeah, I'm like, yay, I can yeah, do correct. Boot. So I jumped in on a T14 AMD Gen 3, and it was a disaster with both FreeBSD and Proxmox, which is like hard to do. So I, I went down to a Gen 2, and it worked out quite well. Uh, although, do not update the trackpad firmware. It will start <laughs> jumping all over the place with XORG, which don't get me started. So... That all said, uh, Philip, anything else related to that? And I, let's try to do some little uh, hallway hackathon on the GPU topics. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, yeah, basically making it uh, so Beehive is usable as a desktop replacement when I yep. still have requirements of using uh, non-free BSD, specifically Windows. Um, And I'll take it a step further. I'm working with a client using pretty much bread and butter Windows and to use Windows without complete hosted ZFS behind the scenes is just self-punishment such that every desktop should boot into a real thin shim of FreeBSD with ZFS and then be Windows and look as if <laughs> through Windows. You can snapshot it, you can replicate it, you can then virtualize it and boot up a backup. It's like, that's the future. I am racing to get there. And thank you for inadvertently nudging me to return to that. Oh yeah, that'd be lovely that... Uh... The, the ideas of thin clients from 20 years ago, like the, the sun thin client idea? Uh, no, it act, yes, but it might actually be a, a hardware desktop that can become a thin client in an instant. That's the beauty of it because of ZFS. What a concept. Uh -huh. So uh, we can uh, come to my talk in, in Ottawa. Oh. <laughs> so that there. said, uh, Dan and John, you rolled in. I apologize. We'll have to postpone the hackathon unless we get to it after this. But do you have any topics before Chris unleashes on his massive amounts of progress to report? Uh, I on the wall today. Thank you. Cool. No worries. And uh, I see mention of Fresh Boards. I'll put uh, Dan on <laughs> there as actually a, as a co-topic presenter. So uh, Chris, if you're ready, stand by. Dan, uh, I did also see this recent mention of Fresh Ports needing help. What can you tell us about that? Because if, for those who are not Following along, uh, Dan, I believe, created Fresh, Fresh Ports and is the maintainer of it. Yeah, Fresh Ports started about 24 years ago. And at some time, I will no longer be able to take care of it. So it's good to bring on people to learn how to maintain it and update it. So there's a transition plan. And we're not talking one or two years. It's talking, you know, six or seven years out. But so long as there's a team behind it, it should survive when I no longer can or want to take care of it. That's basically it. There's a, oh. If you go to list.freshports.org, there's a, there's a website, there's a mailing list there that you can join up. Ah, okay. What are the options? Uh, they are beta coders and CVS all. Yeah, you want the coders. Got it. People helping with fresh ports. So sign in there and tell us who you are. It's a bit of a chicken and egg situation because you can't just let anyone in that's not known, you know. Yeah. But I also have to let people in. So we'll see. So is there anything fundamental in the architecture of it that it couldn't become a project handled by cluster atom over in freebsd land where they do no. all the ci no. stuff and a whole bunch of things there because it's, it, it's it, such a useful site and it's so much in their interests it runs in two jails yeah 
Okay. So there's a there's a jail that processes the incoming commits, and there's a jail that displays the database contents on the web page. And so really you need a third jail, which is the database server. But okay. I, 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 right now it's running on AWS, but it, it also runs on a number of other hosts as well. Cool. Uh, anything else on that topic? No. Cool. Welcome, Santiago. I apologize that we may have to postpone the hackathon towards later in the call, and I'm not ready with the thing I wanted to do, to talk about. However, uh, Philip is wanting to do exactly what I wanted to work on, so I will share scripts as appropriate. Uh, Santiago, do you have any topics that are not hackathon that are perhaps news before we jump into a whole bunch of news items from Chris? Yes, I broadsided you. And you're muted. Chris, is there anything in the quarterly report that you feel is uh, should be on the radar of this group? Um, so basically, I think most of the stuff that is in the quarterly we've talked about before. I just wanted to highlight that um, we now have, let's say, uh, some news for a broader audience. And uh, that is very much about, you know, the process supervision, the, the, the DIO performance measurements that we started. And uh, and last but not least, what was it? Let me check. Nice, uh, right, VM State D. I also put that in there. Cool. Hey, and you put this these calls in there. I appreciate that. And the documentation update is also in there, right? Um, we put a lot of stuff uh, in the uh, handbook. So that is also... Uh, up to snuff, but still a work in progress, obviously. Um, it's a journey. <laughs> it is a journey, definitely. So um, that is the quarterly updates. Uh, the second thing I stumbled across, probably you guys have seen it as well, is the uh, the work that is happening on the IOMMU driver. I do tell, yes. Is that in the report? IOMMU. Um, I uh, might be, yeah. Previous AMD. Oh, yes, do tell. Uh, Kib, yes. Okay. And perfect. Oh, thank you, Greg, or whoever we have to thank for that, because it's been a pain point. Oh, Santiago, I bet you're hopefully dancing right now because he really drove that awareness. Yeah, we, we also actually mm -hmm. talked about this the last time, I think, with Antronik, um, because mm -hmm. he said he does not see the problems. Correct. And after reading Correct. the documentation, we realized that uh, the problems apparently occur only uh, after a couple of restarts, I think. And Antrinic actually did not really test that in that much detail. So we figured he's going to have a closer look as well. Fantastic. So maybe the next time he's around, we can ask him. Amen and hallelujah. Because, yeah, uh, you know, it's it's a it's obscure enough hardware that, well, I only have a, an approximation of it with my ARM hardware. And most users don't have something of the scale that either Antrinic or Santiago are working with. So Fantastic. Uh, a good, good, good attention to the AMD IOM uh, issues. Fantastic. Oh, and related, uh, Mark Johnston has posted a review of the Beehive ARM user space components. So hopefully that review gets some love and gets thrown into head because then it becomes a a fully usable uh platform so that is exciting chris thank you so so much for all of that uh oh and you even got you through an iommu you beat me to it yeah that, uh, actually that reminds yeah. me um yes that reminds me since you since you mentioned greg greg actually asked on a new on a, on a mailing list whether we want to have another enterprise working group call i uh, made a suggestion to have one, but maybe it would be worthwhile if any other people are interested in, you know, convening and getting what? some status updates of what is happening around the other work streams. Then it would probably be good if uh, more than just me would reply. Perfectly happy to. That said, are they not regularly scheduled? That's the thing. At the moment, oh, they aren't really. I wasn't. That was never clear to me because it's a new thing. And okay, go. Cool. Um, that was. One of my questions a while back, Michael, maybe I didn't ask it very well. You're super boomy. 
do whatever you did last time. You're you're overdriving the audio. So either back off your mic or turn something down or push the thing. He's muted to probably adjust to a different microphone. I'm totally cool with John the like rapper, but I don't know. Or uh so we'll give you a sec. Uh and I'll say it again. I naively didn't realize those weren't uh, regu regularly scheduled. So yes, either right before BSD can or right after it. Go ahead, John. Give that a try. Is that any better? That's definitely better. Thank you. Okay. So um, I got? was just just going to say, yeah, I uh, agree. I may not have phrased it well, but I was asking about those uh, those calls. Uh, I don't know, maybe a couple of months ago. Uh, It'd be nice to have, even if we had something once a month. Uh, yeah, and there were certain conferences and you name it. So I think with that dust settling, the time is right. So uh, Chris, uh, find that miraculous time zone that doesn't conflict with, I, I guess, works for everyone. <laughs> It'll be the Mars time zone, I think. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, uh, then you definitely have positive feedback from John and I on on scheduling the call. Okay. I will uh, perhaps tell, right I will before BSD Greg. can, just so that we're kind of all ready to, you know, kind of go working group informally or informally there. I've uh, been wondering. Uh, uh, I'll just put a big old yes there. Uh, great. And this is, oh, the archives link. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's talk Linux loading for Beehive. What you got is that Warner's work or something else? You've got Rob Norris. Uh, there's oh, yes. Rob Norris is working on something, and he's actually asking for feedback. I mean, this I, I, I'm thinking this looks interesting, but I have to admit, it is a little bit above my pay scale. <laughs> I hear you. I think he gave a talk at the Dev Summit in Taipei, and I don't know if that was recorded, but maybe it was. Uh, it was promising, and I, it's like, this is briefly uh, Linux. This is boom now for APSC. Uh, if someone's in the mood, maybe see if those videos have landed, but yeah, very cool. Um, uh, recorded So oh, cool. Uh, there it is on everyone's radar. Hopefully there's a recording that goes into more depth, but that's a great message regarding it. Uh, All right, the next item. Yes. The next item, uh, the Beehive man page review has landed. I hope it will make it into 14.1. This is a, an initial cleanup in terms of, you know, the dash S option has always been like terrible to read. Yep. And this is really the first step to clean this up. And once we have that, then we can finally, you know, add additional stuff in there and probably revise it further, let's say. Uh, I couldn't help but notice that I believe dash W fell out of the stable branch, but not in current. So I hopefully that made it back. But one of the flags vanished and that's in the in the history there. I I think that is I'm that has been one. fixed if I remember correctly. Awesome. And do drop Andy at Omni OS um, a message when this lands because about a year ago I sat down and and deduplicated the uh, Illumos and the FreeBSD Beehive manual pages because it was real simple stuff like you know memory given a given an example of capital M or lowercase M and they were just slightly inconsistent, which was not a great look. So if there's, you know, text for them to steal with identical features, I'm all for it. There it is. Great. Yay. So excellent work. Long overdue. Fantastic. Any questions for Chris before he dives into VM State D? Okay, Mr. ASCII Art, what you got? <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, basically, this is an idea that Jan brought up last week, and I just wanted to verify my approach. So Jan suggested to 
<clears throat> set up a virtual console, a PTI, from within VMstateD. And the way I understand it, I suppose Beehive would then, you know, connect the console to that terminal. And that in principle should, or in theory, should allow, for example, VMstateD CTL to connect to a socket. And then VMstateD would pass the console through to the client, basically. And uh, this way, we wouldn't have to deal with, you know, um, what's it called, the NMDM devices. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to verify if I got the approach right. So um, since Jan's not here today, I guess I will have to wait with the answer unless any one of you guys is smart enough to decipher <laughs> what I painted here and if that makes any sense to you. I'm going to poke at you, John. Does that sound or feel right? Let's go full emotional there. I think so. Um... The, the main thing that um, I'm wondering about is whether it will actually work if I give a deaf PTI whatever path to Beehive as the backend for Comport. Because if that works, I think the rest will work as well. But the thing is, I didn't test that. I, I don't have a specific answer for that. Um, the only thing I'm looking at here, and I'm just kind of running this all through my head, is um, I, it, and this is this is great work. I currently use SoCat, and um, I attach to the consoles. Uh, one end is one end I use is over TCP, and I from so I have an administrative machine where I can attach to all my hypervisors and connect to their, uh, the consoles of all of the VMs running on the systems. And I'm, I'm looking at this, trying to, to figure out, um, if they're what my, when you say socket, um, console zero dot sock, are we referring to a local file system, uh, device or are we talking about something that I can push to a TCP IP stack or do I need to put my own layer in there again, I, if that makes sense? The thing is, if we, if we built this right, I would expect that it can go both ways, that you could have either a local socket or a TCP socket, because technically speaking, the, 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 the the code that let's say ships the data back and forth between the, the console and the the socket. Uh, if 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 we built this right and generically, then it would make no difference. I, right. It should. I would think it shouldn't care. Um, right. Devils in the details. <laughs> yeah, that that is a very good point, though. <laughs> and I'll throw in one comment. Beehive generally is really picky about things pre-existing that you refer to in the config file. So if you do need to rely on a a socket somewhere just make sure it, it pre-exists rather than thinking you can like hot plug it that's all well yes and that is one more reason where vm state d basically would help because vm state d is the process that actually launches beehive so it would right. create the pti device first and then hand that path to via uh, to beehive so we would you know sidestep all the problems with numbering and the uniqueness of NMDM devices and so on and so forth, everything, you know, would, be, would be immediately thing. fixed. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, because that housekeeping is what all those exactly, yeah. frameworks focus on or get, you know, tied up in when it's really the service management that they're missing. And that's what you're addressing beautifully. Anything new from Japan, if you know what I mean? Uh, 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 he, you know, he you had a great call with Jan and him uh, giving a presentation of his work, which is quite similar, but but pre. Uh, right. What's the, what's his name again? Um, Richiro, I believe. Yeah. Uh, just curious uh, if, if you know. I have not I have not checked his progress to be honest uh, recently. 
Cool. And also, have you looked at slipping jail into VM state D so that you can kind of follow the zones model of having a jailed VM in your magic? I check that out and actually put a chapter into the handbook on that. Goodness, good man. Okay. That, I, I believe that actually already landed, if I'm not mistaken. And... Okay. And note the last two calls. Jan has found some issues with package base and the workarounds and lots of clever ways to populate a thin jail for this purpose. So lots is going on. Cool. Any questions for Chris? And if you, in case you missed it, Zelta hit ports, and it looks like the M State D is getting an update. And let's take a look. Bugs. Is, da, 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 da. Chris. Great. Yeah, that is uh, looking good. Cool. Uh, I three eighty six is going to be exploded um, to also fix the ports fallout that I've been getting recently for the okay. older versions. Cool, cool, cool. And one of the major one of the major fixes here in terms of what has previously been in ports is that there's actually two major things. The first thing is that previously when a when a beehive process went into the basically failure state, there was no way to actually reset it. Mm -hmm. Now that is possible. And the second major thing that's gonna change is that the the workflow engine or state engine in the, in the back is basically multi-threaded. So even if you have a long running process that keeps VM state D busy uh, between the different state changes of a virtual machine, this is not gonna affect other virtual machines because previously that, that would have happened. Cool. Uh, now, do you, do you have any ARM hardware within reach given that we may have meaningful ARM 64 support come, say, BSD can. Not yeah. at the moment. I, I mean, do closed. believe I have a Raspberry Pi 4 lying around somewhere, but um, that's only got 4 gigs of RAM. Not really oh. sure whether that is a great test. Right. Test you rig. can make FreeBSD small, and you can make VM small, just saying. Uh, owner's status uh, open. Here we go. Search. I'm trying to find Mark J's review, which hopefully is closed. And I just made that impossible to find. Uh, ARM. So yeah, great. Um, GDB stub, BCI bars, ARM V8. That sounds like the old one. Migration, yeah, okay. I'm warm, you know. Cool. Well, uh, get that on your radar, especially when it comes to porting, because then suddenly you may have be removed I386, but you need to uh, focus on a new Nifty platform. So, fantastic work. Uh, PCI pass-through, perhaps not yet supported. Okay, well, maybe his review is in upstream, and it is time for me to try it again on my old ancient Thunder X. Hallelujah! So, Chris, did your monologue reveal any questions and points you've uh, for forgotten and want to add? No, I think that's it. That's impressive. Great work. Any questions for Chris? Okay. Um, John and Santiago, did you come all rigged up for hackathon type things or were you both hoping to be flies on the wall? And Santi, I'd love to hear how you're doing. It's been a while since you've been able to join a call. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, sir. Hello. Oh, cool. Excellent. Hello. Um, not news, to be honest. I haven't had much time to do anything related to BSC. So, how are things in the lab? Uh, uh, okay, man. I just killed one of our servers trying to pass through on AMD with 14 that I never tried before, or 14 P6. Um, yeah, it did crash. So I will need to wait until they do the MMU, IO MMU, uh, because it doesn't work. Had those, was that news on your radar? And are you just following, say, CGIT to make sure? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm following every day the, the commit to see Excellent. how it's going. But yeah, I, I well. yeah. yeah. But apart from that, everything has been okay. I mean, you know, I haven't seen anything crazy. But again, I, I haven't spent much much time testing on the lab this month. Okay, no worries. And I'll drop this in chat. Uh, DC gets the the headline okay. news kind of way to look at things, and I'm glad. Mark is starting to drop things in there, especially for ARM64. Let's see for, as uh, you mentioned, uh, Beehive Control, YMC3L. No, but maybe it's in hiding in there and not in the review. So that's good stuff. Um, and John, regarding Hackathon, that was definitely of interest to you, but are you set up to poke at hardware in any way, shape, or form? or not today. not really today sorry no, um no, i, I do sorry with with a bunch of advanced planning um i can probably get hold of an arm based uh super micro system that has a gpu in it uh i don't remember what it is an a10 or an h100 or something i don't remember Is that amd or arm it's a arm box from Supermicro. That's a thing? <laughs> I did not I've not heard those words in the same sentence. Uh, I take that back. That that particular system is AMD. Okay. Sorry. Okay, no worries. I, yeah, no. I, I, um, I confuse them all the time. And I might also be able to get a an Intel box. Um but they're they're in use by various people and I just have right. to pull them back for for hacking on. No worries. Um Supermicro does make ARM machines, though. They do. I did not. Yes, know they do. Yeah. Uh, cool. I, I deal with both, so I get confused sometimes. So it is a thing. Cool. I, Even though it's not what we're talking about. We kind of technically are talking about both, which is great. Uh, lab slash GPU. So would you like... Uh, so yesterday's OpenZFS call proved that brainstorming things like what to achieve at a hack, at a conference are really handy. What uh, specific hackathon topics might you have, such as anything and everything related to the AMD IOMMU, and then some uh, shit. Uh, AMD IOMMU. Any other topics? I guess uh, Philip. Uh, Windows and GPU pass through, which is a topic for me too. So, Philip slash Michael, Windows desktop GPU PT, P PCI pass through. Others, any you want to throw out there? Chris, is that on your radar? Dan, I, Home Assist, Nifty. Components that only work under certain other OSs to check the temperature of your fish tank. Um, and one thing that came up was uh, the broader move. And someone's got a bunch of background noise. So John, I'm going to mute you. Uh, the broader move to Dev CTL, I believe it is, rather than say putting things only into the loader. Uh, do CTL. I have not done uh, too much work with that. Um, I'm simply not using those facility that facility under FreeBSD right now. The systems that do use that are um, basically staying with Linux for now. But I do have a question. Yes, um, and I did actually respond to the committer. There was a commit made to the VMM uh, documentation man page uh, maybe a week ago. And uh, I had responded to him with a, um, it would by, be nice if there was a reference in the VMM man page that basically said, you don't actually have to do this. You could use uh, dev CTL to yes, manipulate sir. the device, to de manipulate the Sorry. devices and assign the uh, drivers. Yeah. 
It's a good point. I see a lot of people doing still rebooting machines and changing the loader instead of using the CTL. So yeah. To that point, I will uh, cherry pick the docs I was just mentioning that Villip you'll want to see when I get it working. Uh, here is a, a super key point. Um, one, the pass through will not work without VMM loaded. And so a whole bunch of people are like, that's nah, not working, including myself. So other uh, documentation definitely wants to mention that. And there's few and far between things like John's, uh, John's blog post on the topic. And uh, I'll just throw it out here. So for example, I, you want to be, uh, on Intel, fortunately, the GPU and the USB device are in the same location. So that is something you can kind of blindly shoot at. And I'm grateful for that. So that said, um, I do things like, first think in my head, do I want to identify it as perhaps the name it gives or the ID it gives, because they're at least fixed in that regard. I do a PCI conf dash L just to kind of uh, look for the none device, because once it's removed, it shows up as none. Then once set, grep for set. And it's also smart to do a uh, D message tail at the end of each of these. So you get to see if it was successful or not. That's not super scientific, but man, it's helpful in the lab. So there you go, Philip. There's some of the basics for the heavy lifting and get that right. Oh, and on top of that, um, more. Uh, yeah, you really apparently need a bunch of additional things set in. Uh, and yeah, I wish I had all the answers right now, but thank you, Corbin, for directing me to these. But things like, like these, which is absolutely not obvious and thank you Corvin for taking however many hours it took to figure that out because yeah no that's not obvious anyway so Chris between uh, documentation and Philip wanting to do this in practice and John having a question yes I just posted to the chat a little a slightly more complicated test sequence beautiful um, that takes into account loaded unloaded or loaded but not configured correctly which I uh, burned me one time you did have some extremely good points on that where it it seemed, is that a good word? It seemed like it should work, but it wasn't quite okay. Right. It shows it's loaded, but it doesn't actually work. And I eventually chased that down to um, the the bias settings. Right. Uh, what, I, what I thought. Yes. Um, the, it used to be that uh, you very much had a hard failure with the VMM module if you don't have the resources. But now it's like, yeah, I can, I'll, I'll get halfway there. And uh, that may have been maybe a debugging function. But yeah, good point. Um, error not active. Just, oh, there you go. Beautiful. If that okay. helps anybody. That, that absolutely helps. Thank you. And yeah, uh, Philip, looking at you. Yeah. This is things yeah, that you, you really don't want to go through these this headache again. Well, and, <laughs> and that's John where the, the, when I tried, I mean, this is several years ago. I tried, you know, setting it up uh, and it just didn't work at first. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to reboot to, you know, Windows mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't want to take the, the time to figure out because I'm not smart enough to get all these things to work. You are smart uh, enough, but, but, but yes. Yeah. So I mean, usually if uh, if John or someone else had a here do this and it works, it's like okay, well I'll, I'll go that and you know make that happen because my workstation is an older uh, Xeon with an older uh, you know GPU on it, so uh, it'll probably work with all of the stuff that's you know in place. So it's like great, I just need to know what to do. Uh, let me give you another tip that will save you an amazing amount of headache. If you're, so the independent GPU vendors all have like driver packages and you just grab the package and have a nice day. But Intel ones are generally handled by either Microsoft or Intel or someone in between without just a real obvious 
driver package, although you can grab them from maybe the, uh, if you know which one you need, you go to like the Windows update website and grab it if you're really lucky and try to install it. So my workaround is you boot to the hardware with a, a USB drive, uh, something small enough, smaller than your internal storage, and I completely set up Windows on that. And once it's happy on that hardware with that GPU, I then camdd that over to, in my case, a file, but you could use a Zvol. Then you virtualize that and you've kind of guaranteed, oh, and of course on ZFS, you can roll back because you know if it unloads the driver for you and it shouldn't have, you really want to go back to whatever set of steps is you know helpful and reproducible. Okay, uh, interesting, yeah. Yeah, that saved DD or cam dd that off and do all your windows updates that you know there's a an hour of time just of it pulling in <laughs> that's like blah, a day blah, blah, blah. there's a day <laughs> and then uh that can be faster under beehive but when it comes to all the drivers you want yep get the correct ones from that hardware because you're literally booted to that hardware so off to a file or z vol for vert two and snapshot that I can't emphasize enough. <laughs> I, yeah, I can't. So there's some tips to set y'all off in the right direction for future hackathon efforts and experimentation. Hopefully save you a few hours in little things like, oh, it's there, but it's not there. Other topics or questions or ideas or requests. Uh, John, can you make it to BSD can? Same with Santiago. And yeah, mm, sure yet, maybe, maybe, cool, cool, cool. Maybe. No, not this year. It's like almost your same time zone, right, John? Just, you know, <laughs> just head north, just boom. Okay, uh, anything else at this time, or shall we call it good? Sounds like there's not much more to say. Well, Chris. Do you want to do the honors? Like and subscribe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I will call it at the correct time zone, which is 1749 UTC by popular demand. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Have a good one.